Hi, welcome to unit eight. This is part two of our musculoskeletal unit. Um, last week we talked about fractures, cast care, traction, internal fixation, external fixation, and musculoskeletal assessment. And it was pretty substantial. It was about three hours and 45 minutes of uh, audio lecture. This week may be a little bit lighter, but it's still gonna be a pretty large amount of content. And then our third segment, we'll finish up with um, a few things like hip replacement, knee replacement, and arthritis. So the third unit will be really short, which I hope you'll appreciate because I know you'll be studying hard for Nursing 137's final. This week, what we're planning to talk about is osteomyelitis, which we already introduced in the previous chapter when we talked about open fractures and um, skeletal traction. And we're going to talk about amputation. Uh, traumatic amputation and um, amputations that are performed non-traumatic for diabetes, peripheral vascular disease. Um, and then we're going to talk about the metabolic bone disorders. Now, Paget's disease and osteomalacia, you'll notice, are only like, you know, a page or two in your textbook. They aren't um, very substantial areas to cover. But osteoporosis is a much bigger one. And um, because it affects so many people, um, and because it has consequences that relate to the fracture content and relate to hip replacement, we're going to spend a little more time with it. And we're going to talk about uh, prevention of some of these diseases, prevention of osteomyelitis, prevention of amputation, and prevention of osteoporosis. Um, so get your notebooks and uh, we'll begin. Okay, so it's time to revisit the concept of osteomyelitis. We did talk about it quite a bit when we talked about um, pin site care and when we talked about open fractures, why we cover an open fracture with a sterile dressing, why we're so meticulous with um, pin care for skeletal traction, external fixators. And you'll also notice that a lot of orthopedic surgeons are very meticulous about preventing infection. Um, the OR is always consider considered a sterile environment However, the orthopedic surgeons sort of take it one step further, and some of you were lucky enough to witness the orthopedic surgeries. And you'll notice that most of the time, unless it's a dire emergency, uh, they're going to have their patient use um, special chlorhexidine impregnated wipes or um, a solution to shower with before, and then they're going to ask them to wash again the morning of. They... Um, will dress themselves in their special space suits. It's kind of interesting to watch. And they are very um, prone to yelling at people for any perceived contamination that might occur. Um, there's also a protocol where they give that antibiotic, usually ANSEF, within the, the hour um, of incision. And they'll usually treat with uh, broad-spectrum antibiotics after. Um, so there are three types of osteomyelitis that you need to be aware of. The first one is most common in the pediatric population. It is the hematogenous type. And that just means it originates in the blood. So when you get sepsis or a systemic blood-borne infection, sometimes that will travel to the bone and lead to osteomyelitis. The second type, which is the type that we were most concerned with, is the continuous focus, focus um, type of osteomyelitis. And that means that the contiguous focus is something next to or adjacent to the bone. So when you have a pin site and there's a skin infection and that travels down the pin into the bone, that's a contiguous focus infection. Um, also, if you have a surgical incision that becomes infected, that wound infection can sometimes travel down to the bone and cause an osteomyelitis. And that happened with one of our patients in clinical who had a knee surgery, um, and that infection traveled to the bone. And there are osteo forms of osteomyelitis that are associated with peripheral vascular disorders. So patients with venous stasis ulcers or arterial insufficiency ulcers, diabetic foot ulcers, Sometimes we'll get um, gangrene or other infections, and that will travel to the bone as well. Um, so these are very difficult infections to treat, and we've already sort of talked about why that is. 
and it has to do with the nature of bone. It has to do with the um, blood flow within the bone, and it has to do with the dense nature of bone tissue. Um, you know, it doesn't really let a lot of the immune factors in. It's very hard for the white cells to come in and um, wall it off. Um, and we'll talk about some of the changes that are associated on x-ray when the immune system does try to fight this infection. So the main organisms that cause osteomyelitis, we already talked about staph, excuse me there, aureus, um, and that is the most common because it colonizes on the skin. Um, a little more persistent than staph epidermidis, and certainly when you're looking at MRSA, it's a little bit more difficult to treat because of resistance to, resistance to antibiotics. You can also see strep. And that's, you see that a lot with the hematogenous, um, group beta strep, uh, strep throat. Sometimes when these infections become systemic, they can colonize in the bone. And then you see those organisms. Um, Pseudomonas is another one. Pseudomonas is known as bluish green. It's got a very weird, funky, Swedish odor. When you smell it, you'll know it forever. Um, so Pseudomonas is one of them. And then sometimes you'll have enterococcus um, bacteria, but the most common by far is your staph aureus. The chief signs and symptoms of osteomyelitis are the things that you normally associate with inflammation and infection, but um, generally you're gonna have bone pain and that pain is described as constant throbbing or pulsating they can usually point right to the spot. It's well localized and it's worse with movement. Um, you're going to get redness and swelling at the site of the infection. It's going to feel hot. There should usually be a fever. However, when osteomyelitis becomes chronic or when you see it in elderly patients who are a little bit immunosuppressed, that fever may be low grade um, or it may only occur in the afternoons or in the evenings. Um, Generally speaking, when, the, uh, when it's an acute onset, you'll see that higher fever. Um, but when it becomes a chronic thing, you might not. Okay, here at the bottom, you see I've added a star, and I've kind of highlighted this. The main laboratory finding you're going to see with osteomyelitis is elevated white count and an elevated ESR, which stands for erythrocyte sedimentation rate. And these are sort of uh, big red flags that you've got osteomyelitis going on, especially when you consider all of the other, um, the bigger clinical picture. Um, so that would be something that you would definitely associate with osteomyelitis. So there are some tools that the physician can use to confirm the diagnosis of osteomyelitis um, if the clinical picture sort of suggests that. And one of the ways that that can be assessed is through the bone scans that use radioisotopes. And the procedure for this um, is that you would inject the radioisotope into the IV about two to three hours before the procedure was scheduled to happen. Um, the patient will feel some flushing and warmth as you do that. They should be educated that they will experience that. Um, the other important nursing considerations is that, uh, are that the patient needs to be still during the procedure um, and they need to empty their bladder. You may need to sedate a patient who isn't reliable enough to hold still. The procedure takes about 30 to 60 minutes. And so if you don't think the patient can hold still or if they're in quite a bit of discomfort, you might want to um, sedate them. You need to get a doctor's order, obviously. So uh, after the bone scan happens, you've got this um, nuclear material that needs to be excreted, and we push fluids on people so that they um, can sort of flush that out a little bit faster. Contraindications to this would be, you know, patients who have uh, decreased kidney function and pregnant women. Um, you would not do this procedure. You could, however, do an MRI, um, and that will detect changes. What you would be looking for in either one of these, you could see elevations in the periosteum, 
that um, membrane that goes around the bone. Um, or you could see general, uh, the in inflammation in the soft tissues or in the bone. And you would also, um, in the nuclear scans, see the increased uptake of nuclear material into the bone. So those would all be findings that would be positive for that. MRI, it's the same considerations we talked about with fracture. No metal in or on the patient. Um, assess for claustrophobia. If they're getting contrast, assess for allergies. Um, it's really the same. Tell them that they're going to hear pinging and knocking noises in the chamber and um, that they'll be able to communicate with a technician the whole time. Um, so basically the same considerations that we had for any MRI. Um, lab values, again, the white count and the ESR, a very important um, findings that support a classic clinical picture. And wound and blood cultures, um, if you are suspecting that it is a hematogenous um, origin, you might do blood cultures. Wound cultures would be that contiguous focus. However, just be aware that um, only about 50% of the time will you actually grow an organism that supports your um, osteomyelitis diagnosis. Now, with chronic osteomyelitis, the picture looks a little bit different. Um, again, the fever isn't present. Usually, you might have a low grade or an intermittent fever. You might not have any fever. The white count is normal. The ESR can be normal. Um, this is the body is just no longer fighting this infection. It's become sort of almost a normal, um, not normal, but the, the body has just kind of given up. Um, it's a chronic thing. What you will see on bone scans and MRI and x-ray is evidence of recurring bone abscesses. Um, these sequestra is like a little area um, where the bone has become necrotic. And you might see abnormal cavities, like holes in the bone. Or you might see the opposite, which is abnormal areas of bone density. Um, so you'll start seeing these um, abnormal deformities of the bone that are associated with um, chronic infection. And what happens is this person um, really never gets over it. You'll just have different little foci of that um, infection. Um, and it can be very, very painful. One of my first patients in um, nursing school was somebody who had chronic pain syndrome related to osteomyelitis that just could never be treated. Um, so this is just something that you should be aware of. Okay, so when we're treating osteomyelitis, we're looking at long-term antibiotic therapy. It usually starts out IV. And because it's long-term, we're not going to keep um, a peripheral line in for, you know, the two to six weeks that it takes to, you know, deliver these IV antibiotics. You're usually going to have these people go home or go to rehab with a PICC line. Um, if the organism is staph, your drug of choice is usually vancomycin. Um, but if it's, you know, other organisms, I think pseudomonas, they use maxapine, which is also known as cefepime. Um, some of your anaerobics, they might use different agents. Um, it's good to get a culture and sensitivity if you can, but we already noted the difficulty is that you can't always do that. Um, so... Vancomycin, in most cases, for Staph aureus is going to be your drug of choice. You can convert to PO, usually after about six weeks, and that you might have to treat for four to eight weeks. And the reason that we're doing this for such a long time is that the medications have a hard time reaching the bone. Remember that one of the things that happens, one of the pathophysiology um, factors, is that the bone dies. You get these bone abscesses, and then there's necrosis. Um, so it, it takes longer for the medication to be therapeutic. Um, and it also um, takes longer for the body's responses to be effective as well. Supportive treatment, in addition to um, IV antibiotics and then your PO antibiotics, we're looking at good nutrition. Um, we're looking at control of risk factors like diabetes. Smoking, smoking decreases blood supply to everything, including bone. Um, so general good supportive care, hydration, 
Um, those would be some things that we would want to do to support healing. So what do we do if these things aren't enough? Well, there are surgical treatments. Um, you might have to go in and debreed. Um, if there are sinuses, you might actually um, use those beads. Um, that are impregnated with the antibiotics. And let me see if I can find that picture for you again. Uh, bear with me for just one second. I know I have it. Uh, probably should have paused this, but no, wait, here it is. Okay, so you can see those little yellow beads of antibiotic, and I know we talked about them in class too. Um, you can directly treat the wound um, if that's, you know, if it's a contiguous focus kind of um, osteomyelitis. So let's get rid of that now. Second time's a charm. Okay. You can also create a muscle flap. There we go. Um, bone grafting to replace um, areas of necrotic bone. Um, these are all surgical treatments for osteomyelitis. Additionally, one treatment that can be used, um, especially when it is a contiguous focus or a peripheral vascular um, type of osteomyelitis, is hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And what that does, that um, floods the tissues with oxygen locally, as opposed to um, a systemic treatment. Um, in cases where it's a peripheral vascular disorder, where you have arterial insufficiency and oxygenated blood is not reaching the tissue, um, this could be helpful. Okay, so now that you know how dangerous osteomyelitis is, it can actually lead to amputation if treatment is unsuccessful. Um, we're going to focus our efforts on preventing it in the first place. And one thing that we want to do um, to prevent it is to time elective orthopedic surgery um, for a time when the patient is optimally healthy. So if your patient is a smoker, you tell them to quit smoking for two weeks prior to the procedure. If they're diabetic, you try to get their blood sugars under control. If their nutritional status is poor, you try to improve that. Um, but you don't want to rush them into an elective knee or hip surgery when they are a little bit weaker and a little more prone to infection. Let's see if I can fix that a little bit. Okay, so time that. Um, you're going to uh, do everything you can to reduce surgical risk. And remember, we talked about taking those chlorhexidine showers. You do the Hibiclen showers, or they might give you special wipes to... Um, shower with usually the night before you are told to take a shower then you use the wipes then the next morning you're told to use the wipes again um, when you get into the hospital they will cleanse you with chlorhexidine um, scrub um, and then there's the ANSEF um, within an hour of incision time <clears throat> and again obviously we are keeping the OR sterile um, reducing the traffic um, making sure that sterile technique is strictly um, observed. So there's that. Um, another thing that we're going to do is our wound care. And for that, we're going to use a strict aseptic technique. Um, when you are doing dressing changes, a lot of times now you'll see that they do the, um, the glue, Dermabond. And that sort of creates a barrier so that you're not exposing that wound directly to anything infectious. And that is a good practice. It also allows you to visualize the um, wound bed. But if you're not using that dermabond, you need to be very careful with your wound care. Say the patient's had an ORIF and um, that first dressing change, they do. A lot of times they'll leave it open to air if there is dermabond, but if not, you might have to change that dressing and make sure that you are using um, sterile technique. You may use clean gloves, like we talked about in lab, 
um, if that's your hospital policy, as long as you do not contaminate the um, sterile part of the dressing. And that's, um, you know, you have that one inch border. If you go beyond that one inch border, it's contaminated. Um, so you want to make sure that you do pin care on external fixators. And we talked about that a lot yesterday. So um, that is another thing that you will do um, per protocol. And then we're going to teach your patients to keep their wound clean. And most importantly, um, we're going to teach them to report signs and symptoms of infection. Um, basically, if it's an infection that's in the skin or in the wound, it's a lot easier to treat it when it's there. Once it gets all the way to the bone, for reasons that we talked about a little bit extensively, um, you know, it's a lot harder to treat. So a lot of patient education. Um, while I was doing the research for this unit to present it to you guys, um, the running theme that I got from patients on YouTube that post their stories, and God, everybody posts every aspect of their lives on YouTube. Um, but people who are in the hospital after getting something done all say, oh my gosh, I can't believe they're sending me home tomorrow. Um, and that was sort of the running theme. So really, we need to make sure that before that patient walks out the door, that they know exactly when they're going to call their doctor. If you get a temperature of 100.3, if you have redness, heat, warmth, swelling, um, if you have pain that's not relieved by normal measures, call the doctor. And these are really important things to teach your patients.